have folks to share it with, it, it doesn't matter, right? But because you guys took the time out of your schedules to come out and join us here this evening, um, I just couldn't be happier than to see this packed room full of folks. And then we also have thousands of people online who are watching as well, and we're so happy to have them join us here this evening. Um, as we get started, you will see on, this, on the screen here that you can ask your questions using your smartphone at any point in time tonight, whether you are here in this room or online. It's heritageaction.com slash ask. And if you go to that web page, you can just type your question in. You don't, you don't have to put your name or anything. You can just type your question. As we go through the evening, our speakers first are going to give some very short presentations and then um, we're going to be doing Q&A. So we're going to first start with our national anthem, if we, if we could. So if you will stand for that. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pastor Andrew. I'm a, I'm a pastor here at Crossroad Community Church, and I have the privilege to start things off with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, we are grateful. We are so grateful to live in a country, Lord, that allows us to speak truth. Lord, we are so grateful to be called American citizens, Lord, where there, there's religious freedom, God, instituted from the beginning. Lord, we are so grateful. Lord, I ask for everyone in this room to have something that we desperately need, Lord. I'm praying tonight for courage, Lord, that we are not afraid. Lord, we are not afraid to hold on to truth, that we would fight for it, Lord, that we would not be intimidated by any other force, Lord, to compromise what is truth. Lord, and I pray for us tonight, Lord, you have given the discernment to separate what is true and what is false, Lord. So I pray for that wisdom and that discernment here, Lord. And I pray that you cultivate our hearts, God. That you soften us where we need to be softened, Lord. So that we can hear what you would have us hear, Lord. And that we can do your will in this place tonight. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So I have a bit of a unique perspective. I'm a pastor who is ordained, but my degree is in history. 
and I love American history, let me tell you, and I'm very passionate about it, and I've been asked just to share for a couple minutes a, a view of, of critical race theory and the church and faith. So let me start off, I don't know if, what, what you know about critical race theory, but let me tell you this, it has no place whatsoever in the church. No place in the church. And if we want to use chapter and verse, there's a lot to choose from. So I'm just, uh, briefly, I'm just going to cover a few. Uh, one is Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. It says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. The Bible has a unity message. We are one. Listen, that's not popular with identity politics. And it shouldn't be. Jesus says it doesn't matter who your father was or who your father wasn't. You can come to the cross. We are all in the same boat. We are all sinners saved by grace. And we need salvation that comes from only Jesus Christ. That's the message of the gospel. That's not in critical race theory. Proverbs 6, 19 says this. It's in the context of things that God hates. A false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. You're going to learn some things tonight. You're going to learn some truth tonight. And let me tell you, the things that you learn, God does not support. God does not support discord. Listen, if you want to be politically powerful, you need someone to hate someone else. That's not from God. You need to know it. You need to understand. And then this one's less fun, but I'll talk about it anyway. <laughs> Matthew 5, says this, But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Is that the message from critical race theory? It is not. It is not. You read that and you either feel like you're a victim or an oppressor. It's hard lines of putting Americans against Americans. But listen, you're going to get some great information, some fantastic information from fantastic people. You're going to get that tonight. But the question is, where is your heart? It is not for you to leave and now hate the hateful. If you hate the hateful, you will become them. You will become what you hate. So I'm going to read this one more time. You are going to get information. You need to love your enemies. You need to bless those who curse you. There is opposition to what's happening here tonight. Do not hate the opposition. Do good to those who hate you. Ooh, this is not fun. Man, this has turned into a Sunday message. I apologize. It is, a, it is a Thursday night. You were not prepared for this. One more time. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Listen, I'm praying for courage for every one of you. But when persecution comes, pray for those people. Pray for the ones who are deceived. Pray for the deceivers. You won't get that in critical race theory but you'll get it in church. That's all I got to say. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we get a round of applause, please, for our national anthem singer, Miss Leah Rose Fisher, and... Thank you to Roseanne for saying the pledge this evening. It was Roseanne Cholowinski who said our pledge for us. And we're going to start off with Jonathan Butcher this evening. We have a slight change of schedule, but I promise you will still get excellent information. Unfortunately, Mike Gonzalez is unable to join us this evening, um, but Jonathan is here to uh, cover that spot. So, Jonathan. Well, thank you, Melody, and good evening, everyone. My name is Jonathan Butcher, and I am the Will Skillman Fellow in Education at the Heritage Foundation, and I am uh, very pleased to pinch hit for my colleague and generous co-author, Mike Gonzalez, who cannot be here tonight. Mike has large shoes to fill. He was born in Cuba, has lived in seven countries, and written several books that I would recommend to all of you, making him a bit of the, a movie star in the conservative movement. So 
the best I can offer is to be kind of a Danny DeVito to his uh, Antonio Banderas, <laughs> or by the looks of the audience, maybe a Jerry Lewis to his Sean Connery. How's that? <laughs> So, Mike, I hope you're watching, and Melody, please tell him I said he looks like Antonio Banderas. <laughs> so, what is critical theory? To begin, with, to begin with, you'll see on the screen some of the most notable names, uh, George Lucas, um, we have uh, Felix Wheel, who was the one, a uh, wealthy German in the 1920s who called together a first Marxist work week. And it was a group of very frustrated German Marxists that the working class had not overthrown the government in Germany around the same time that the Bolsheviks in Russia were successful. He called this group together and launched what became known as the Frankfurt School, whose most notable president and first, or director, was Max Horkheimer. Critical theory um, is, in essence, rooted in the idea uh, that Marx developed that there are oppressors and the oppressed, beginning with economic classes from the proletariat and the burgeoisy, and they combined it with this concept from Freud that there is no authentic truth or no objective truth, and they merged these two ideas. Horkheimer uh, did this in his inaugural speech as director of the Frankfurt School and noted importantly that not only did he want to prioritize the critical idea that the world is divided between oppressors and the oppressed, but also that culture was what they ultimately wanted to change. It was not just about changing economic classes, but it was about affecting all of the institutions of society and government and culture as we know it. In 1969, I don't know if we can play this clip, if we have the ability to play this YouTube clip. I don't know if the folks in the back can do it. Uh, the point, point here, what Horkheimer is, is emphasizing in this, um, uh, in this quote or comment that he makes right here um, was that Marx uh, notes that there is an, an inverse relationship between, um, between freedom and justice. He was emphasizing even beyond what Marx had said uh, earlier, that there really can be no freedom, and uh, that the only way to achieve justice, as one of the other critical theorists, Herbert Marcuse, would say, was to limit the rights of some and elevate the rights of others. Critical theory's agenda was to dismantle the existing order. Uh, and as you can imagine, when the critical theorists from Germany and the Frankfurt School came to America in the 1930s and settled at Columbia University, they had a look at the American system, at democracy, at capitalism, and felt that the only way that they could change the society in which they had arrived was by dismantling the institutions that all of us know so well and are familiar with. Again, they came uh, to the United States, they settled in the academy, where for many years they influenced students and professors um, around the country. Some from the Frankfurt School uh, stayed in New York, some went to California, uh, Berkeley and elsewhere. Uh, they were particularly influential among um, the law school professors and law school students, which eventually became known, uh, they developed a concept called critical legal theory. So you start with critical theory, the Marxist idea that there is only the oppressors and the oppressed and there is no objective truth. You add to that the perspective from attorneys, from lawyers, law school professors, that American law is systemically oppressive. That's where the oppression comes from, is from law. Moving into the late 1970s and into the 1980s, we they, um, individuals such as Derek Bell, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, Angela Harris, and others added the concept of race on top of critical legal theory because they believed that critical legal theorists hadn't gone quite far enough and that the only way to really exp explain what the oppression looked like and was in the United States was by adding the element of race. And so critical theory became critical legal theory and evolved into critical race theory by the 1980s. As you can see from Marcuse's statement right here, the critical theorists, even some of the originals, believed that they had to move beyond just talking to economic classes and have uh, different ethnicities. People from different racial backgrounds would be, the, uh, would be the classes, would be the people that would overthrow the existing order. As I said, 
Critical legal studies is what developed immediately following critical theory. You can see from the bullet points here, it challenged the rule of law. It challenged the constitutional order. And this was stated very directly by some of the first critical legal theorists, some of the first critical race theorists as well, such as Richard Delgado. He wrote in his introduction to critical race theory that they are ultimately skeptical of the Enlightenment. They are skeptical of the rule of law. They are skeptical of America's legal system. He says this in the introduction. There is no need really for anyone on this panel to quote from a pundit today or to quote from someone that you've already heard on Fox News. You can quote directly from the critical theorists themselves about what, how they describe all of these different critical ideas. Uh, again, uh, critical legal uh, studies attacked not just uh, the concepts of law and the Constitution, but also legal realism, um, as well as, you know, what we're referring to here are the objective truths on which uh, a system based on a rule of law is built. Again, the, it, all of these bullet points, as I go through these quickly, because I know we only have a few minutes before we move to the other speakers, but it, can't be em it cannot be emphasized enough that we're moving from a system that was built on the idea that society can be held together by a system of order, by a system of laws, to the idea that laws are systemically oppressive and that you cannot have a civil society that exists underneath them. A conference that helped to create critical legal studies at the University of Madison in the 1970s. Uh, law schools, again, became centers of this idea that we needed to resist uh, what was happening in society. And again, we can quote straight from Derek Bell, who's known as the godfather of critical race theory. He said that he hoped the academic resistance would pave the way for wide-scale resistance. And that was resistance, of course, to the culture in which we live. Critical race theory, again, becomes in the 1980s. It was a bit of a rift with the critical legal studies movement. They said that critical legal studies hadn't gone far enough and that we needed to, legal, uh, critical theorists had to move a step beyond just looking at the law and to begin to look at ethnic and cultural uh, elements in society as well. There was the, uh, you can see here the, the split, what was the agreement and the disagreement. Um, this is the, the beginning of this concept of white privilege, as you see today in the writings of those such as Robin DiAngelo, who wrote White Fragility, uh, as well as many others who make uh, significant money as diversity, equity, and inclusion speakers at schools, in particular around the country, as well as businesses. Uh, the workshop that created critical race theory, again, uh, in Wisconsin, uh, once again in the late 1980s. This was attended by some of the originals. You see Richard Delgado and Derek Bell's name, uh, two names that I've mentioned already there. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw made it uh, very clear uh, that critical race theory was an offshoot of critical legal studies. It's important to connect this lineage because today, uh, many of those who defend critical race theory will say, no, no, it's, we don't have anything to do with Marxism, or no, there is no lineage with critical uh, legal studies, uh, potentially. Uh, you have this quote here from um, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw um, about critical race theory and critical theory in general and what it, and what it means. I'll give you one other. Uh, from the early 2000s, so more recently, Angela Harris, writing for Columbia University, she wrote that Marx's dazzling analysis of capitalism and that the proletariat would overthrow the system as sure as the sun rises is still inspiring to many contemporary critical thinkers. So I'm paraphrasing her quote there, but she uh, emphasized that Marxism was very much at the root for all critical studies. Critical race theory gained uh, traction not just in law schools, but as you'll see from the speakers on the stage here, as well as in my remarks later, that it was also in um, school colleges of education where teachers were being trained to teach K-12 students. Critical race theorists say specifically, again, um, Delgado in particular, that the Civil Rights Act and the Civil Rights Movement didn't go far enough, that they were essentially incomplete. Uh, Delgado and Jean Stefancic said this in the introduction uh, to their book, uh, Introduction to Critical Race Theory. They made that very clear. A uh, quote here um, about the, the essence of critical race theory. I know that many of these slides, I'm sure, can be uh, made available, and, and Melody can send this to the group. I know I'm moving very quickly through here. Uh, Derek Bell, again, was the godfather of critical race theory. He was a, a law professor. 
um, you'll see, I think it's the next slide here. Uh, you may recognize this, this face. If you don't recognize it, uh, you, um, uh, you may remember him as a former president. Uh, and I think on the next slide, uh, no, I think it was, uh, it was this one. I'm not sure that we can play the tape, but this was uh, at a protest at Harvard Law School where um, uh, uh, soon, someday, future President Barack Obama praises and introduces Derek Bell and thanks him for his work. The goal of critical race theory was making the issue of race and ethnicity the primary driver for public policy and social change. The essence of the idea is that everything must be considered in terms of race. The, the ultimate connection with Marxism and critical race theory today is the idea that we need to have, and you'll recognize these words quickly here, equity instead of equality. Equality means people are treated the same under the law. Equity means that somewhere, somewhere else, something is generating equal outcomes for everyone. And as you'll hear from others on the panel today, the only way that a government can generate equal outcomes is through coercion. Critical race theory, again, has been around since uh, the late 1980s, but as you'll see, it moved into the 1990s, early 2000s, and uh, uh, is very common in uh, colleges of education. There have been studies done, um, uh, particularly by my colleagues at the Heritage Foundation, including Dr. Lindsey Burke uh, and the American Enterprise Institute, Rick Hess, who were looking at the frequency of the use of books such as The Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire, the Brazilian Marxist. That's a very common book that's used today in some of the most uh, competitive colleges of education around the country, um, including the University of Wisconsin. So we have to understand that we have now sown the seeds both in law as well as in education and in beginning in culture as well of this idea that we must disrupt the systems in which we live. That is the ultimate aim of both critical studies as well as critical legal studies and critical race theory. And they have said so, they have said as much. And so it should not surprise us when we read um, some of the headlines that we see on Fox News and other outlets today um, about what some speakers at universities are saying when it comes to um, their feelings of, of disdain, even hatred for uh, the United States, for our founding documents. Um, some of the most um, uh, significant research regarding um, the, the uh, importance of agency and personal responsibility among Americans uh, who are of minority ethnicities, Americans who are black, Americans who are Hispanic, um, emphasize the importance of the family. And once you recognize that individuals from intact families, um, when you take that into account, the differences in uh, life outcomes from um, incarceration to school outcomes to uh, the workplace, uh, those differences begin to disappear when you take into account the children from intact families and from non-intact families. Derek Bell was very clear in his teachings uh, that racism, in his view, was permanent in the United States, and there was nothing that could be done to change it, which gave him and other critical theorists, they felt, the position to say that they should always be in a state of resistance. In fact, you can even look at the subtitle of Derek Bell's book, um, Faces at the Bottom of the Well, and it essentially suggests that racism is uh, inevitable, that it is, uh, will always be here and will always be a, a source of uh, a reason for resistance. As you can see, uh, these were inspirations for uh, Black Lives Matter riots of 2020. Mike's most recent book, uh, which will be coming out later this fall, is avail available on Amazon already, uh, discusses these issues. Uh, these pictures here from are of Angela Davis, who was involved in violent actions in the 1960s and 70s, uh, and her professor uh, Herbert Marcuse, as well as founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. You can identify critical race theory today um, even if they don't use the words critical theory uh, or, or critical race theory, because they are talking about the idea that discrimination is appropriate, that individuals of certain ethni ethnicities deserve uh, special sanction or benefits based simply on the color of their skin, and that there is no future. There is no hope, there is only resistance. 
Systemic racism is a common term that is used. I'm going to move here quickly so that we can get through to the end. I would add uh, meritocracy and colorblindness are two of the ideas that the civil rights movement made so important culturally to Americans as we uh, made the ideas of discrimination and racism abhorrent in society. But critical race theorists uh, today uh, condemn both of those concepts, colorblindness and meritocracy. We talked about equity uh, and equality already and the difference is there. That's the cover of Mike's uh, book, The Plot to Change America, that has come out already. I recommend it to you, as well as pre-orders for his book coming out this fall. So I think I made it through all the slides. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Shee Van Fleet. And um, she comes to us not as anyone who's been involved in politics or in, in, in what we are so involved in educating folks on federal policy and everything that we're seeing happen throughout our culture here. She comes to us as a mom who is so concerned and trying to sound the alarm because she has seen this in China and she has experienced this firsthand. So, Shi Van Fleet. So, yes, mm -hmm. it's on. Hi, I'm not a scholar, first of all, I'm not a historian. What I'm going to share with you is my experience. <laughs> what is going on in America today is a woke revolution. And the woke revolution has a twin brother, and it's the Chinese culture revolution. The woke revolution is driven by CRT, the Chinese Cultural Revolution was driven by, I call it CCT. That's Mao's um, class conflict theory. The grandfather of CRT and CCT is the same guy, Karl Marx. And their ideology is cultural Marxism. I experienced the Chinese Cultural Revolution firsthand. What I'm experiencing today in America is the American version of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Both are communism. This is American tragedy. America sent its daughters and sons all over the world to fight against communism. But today, communism is taking roots in America. Sadly, few people even recognize it. But people like me who experienced um, the uh, communism and cultural revolution, we can see it very clearly. The communism today is everywhere. Its infiltration in America is complete. We see it in our uh, media, in our academia, in our schools, in Hollywood, in our workplaces, in corporations, in our churches, in our government and our political uh, parties, and in our militaries. America don't know much about communism because communism was not taught and stories were not told. We know Nazi Germany, we know uh, Mussolini fascism, but we know very little about communism. And I think it's by design. In order to defeat communism, we have to understand it. The horror stories that took place in Russia, in Soviet Union countries, in China, in Cuba, and in North Korea need to be told to every American. Only when we know the stories can we recognize what's going on here is communism so that we can fight back. Before there is a CRT, there is a CCT. Uh, just like CRT, Mao used CCT to divide people into groups of uh, oppressors and oppressed. Uh, the only difference is he used class rather than race. Mao carried out two revolutions. The first one was the armed insurrection 
against the nationalist government. And uh, he overthrew the government and established the uh, uh, communist rule. His second revolution is the infamous Chinese Cultural Revolution. The aim of that revolution is for him to secure his uh, absolute power by removing his political enemies within the same political, communist political party. For both revolutions, he used CCT to successfully reach his goal for power. In the first revolution, he got popular support from peasants in the overwhelmingly agricultural society. What's the attraction? He promised them free land from the, uh, from the uh, oppressor land-owning class. Um, in the uh, um, land reform, uh, I estimated one million landowners were executed their land um, uh, confiscated and gave it to poor peasants. And that is mouse equity. But before long, all the land was taken back by the state through the collective farming. So there you go. What the state can give you for free, they can also take it back. <laughs> By then, China became technically a um, classless uh, society. No one owned land, no one owned anything. But that did not stop Mao from continuing to use CCT to maintain his power. He redefined um, the concept of uh, class enemy from landowners, from landowners to their offsprings. And then he included uh, counter-revolutionaries rightist to the, uh, uh, to the class, uh, enemy class. During the Cultural Revolution, he added more. The last one he added to the uh, class enemy category is intellectuals. So during the uh, Cultural Revolution, um, everyone can be a class enemy. So that is his way to make sure he always had an ample supply of fake class enemies. Now anyone who dare to step out of line can be labeled counter-revolutionary, rightist. When that happened to you, your life is ruined. That's exactly what CRT does. So CRT also create fake racism. So they could continue to redefine the concept uh, the definition of uh, racism. And now, if you're born to a group or you belong to a group, that can decide uh, that you are racist. If you're born white, you are inherently a racist. Um, if you are a Republican, you're white supremacist. If you challenge the CRT uh, narrative, now you can be a racist. So what they want is total submission. So dividing people and set them against each other is the hallmark of uh, Marxism. And that is the business model for CCT and CRT. What they want is set us, set people against each other and keep them in perpetual conflict. And what is the reason? What is the goal? Power. To, re, uh, to uh, gain and maintain power. That is their goal. I really don't have time to tell you the stories of the Cultural Revolution that will take days. Here I just want to give you a highlight so that you have a sense of the terrifying similarities. Um, Mao uh, launched the Cultural Revolution um, by um, unleash the Red Guards to create total chaos. Um, the Red Guards did what we call it Da Za Qiang, which is translated as uh, violence, rioting, and looting. They destroyed, with Mao's direct uh, uh, support, they destroyed all the law enforcement and the court system. 
That's exactly what we saw on the American streets last year. And those Red Guards were um, indoctrinated youth. They are from universities and then spread to secondary uh, schools, even elementary school. I was the first uh, grader when this happened. I witnessed violence of students against teachers and students against each other. The social justice warriors today in America, there's no difference. Um, uh, there's no difference between them and uh, Mao's Red Guards. Mao also ordered his Red Guards to destroy si jiu, four old things, old ideas, old tradition, old custom, and old uh, habit. So they went ahead, they um, tore down the uh, um, Buddhist statues, destroyed the temples, they raided homes, and took out everything that's old, antique, furniture, races, doesn't matter, and took them out and smashed them, burned them. And uh, the Red Guards also changed uh, street names, store names, uh, school names, and even personal names. I know someone um, uh, personally. His name is uh, Dang Sheng. Uh, it's translated as birth by party, or uh, roughly means uh, party is my own, uh, real parent. That's his way of virtue signaling. So what Mao really wanted is to destroy and cancel the entire Chinese civilization and the traditional culture. And that's what the cancel culture want here. They want to destroy the entire Western civilization, Christianity and American funding. Same thing. For decades, our, um, the radical Marxist professors has been indoctrinating our youth. Many of them are now teachers of our um, public schools. And so they are trained to see everything through the lens of class and, and, and racial justice. So banning CRT in school is uh, the only first step. The battleground is uh, more than the classroom. It is pretty much everywhere. It's in every aspect of our life. So for now, we are really in a war, and that is the cultural war. Yeah, as the saying going, uh, politics is the, uh, uh, is the upstream from, uh, no, polit um, politics is the upstream downstream. Uh, down, uh, of culture. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so what we need to do is really start this uh, uh, a war at the uh, grass, grassroots, as well as the political arena. Um, the uh, cultural Marxism and uh, um, American ideals, there's no common ground. In order for one to prevail, the, the other one must go. So we must fight this war. We have no choice. We have to fight this war and win it to preserve America as we know it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I can't thank you enough, Shi, for being, for being here and for sharing with us your firsthand knowledge. I think it's a real wake-up call for a lot of folks who, who are not connecting the dots, right? And so this is really important. And CRT, critical race theory, in the schools is something that we have been really talking about. And of course, a lot of parents for the first time as their kids were home during COVID, they got to see what the kids were being taught. And they were like, well, well wait, what's that? What's going on? <laughs> and as they, as they dug a little bit deeper, they really were shocked, shocked with what they learned. And so 
Um, Jonathan Butcher is going to come up for a, for a, for a, second, um, a second round here because this time he is going to focus on education instead of just the, the overall portion of this. And um, as he, he mentioned, he is the Will Skillman Fellow in Education at the Heritage Foundation. He's researched and testified on educational policy around the United States and is currently writing a book for um, discussing critical race theory in schools in America, right? Okay, very, do we have a title on that? I didn't. Uh, Splinter. Splinter, very good. All right, very good. Jonathan, one more time. Thank you very much, and it's rare to be on this side of the podium twice in one night, so I can see when everyone is nodding off. So, For those of you that have seen this in your child's school, and if you are nervous about being the only one to speak up, let me introduce you to Rebecca Randall. Teachers at Rebecca Randall's son's school are fixated on skin color, she tells me. She wanted to know, quote, what is the end game? A parent of two living in Texas, Rebecca was furious when her son's teacher implied that the only place that her child could learn about cultural questions involving racial identity was at school. They made the, quote, implication that my children would never receive this education in our home, Rebecca told me. Yet teachers in her son's school had twisted the valuable lessons about treating people the way you want to be treated, Rebecca said. They had been putting race as the most important part of someone's identity, she told me, one of critical race theory's main ideas, as I had just said. Quote, you are racializing children to identify one another, Rebecca told her son's teachers. Her son's school had put a book, on the, had a put a book list on the school's website that included Woke Baby, which describes an infant stretching in the morning as if reaching for justice like a panther, a not-so-subtle nod to violent activists from the 1960s. Her son's teacher wrote the letters BLM on the board one day to describe something that inspires her, a reference to the Black Lives Matter movement. Quote, they have moved away from the academic rigor that they had, Rebecca said, and are focusing on political correctness. Her two children, both under 11 years old, need to be learning academics, she said. They are not to be protesting in the name of critical race theory. With some of the questions that were sent to the speakers prior to this event, it seems that you don't need to be told that critical race theory's racial discrimination is happening elsewhere. But this example should demonstrate that those of you that have seen this happening at your child's school, that you're not alone. One of the questions that was sent was whether critical race theory is being taught in Delaware schools. This afternoon, a quick search found a page on the Brandywine District's website in Wilmington where Ibram X. Kendi was listed as a recommended reading along with an article that allowed you to quiz yourself to find out if you are supporting white supremacy, implicit bias resources, or an article that was entitled, quote, how can parents make their kids understand how to be anti-racist? The problem with anti-racism, as defined by Ibram X. Kendi, is that the only way to solve present discrimination is with future discrimination. That's, those are his words, not mine. The mainstream media gives us the impression that critical race theory is a harmless idea helping us understand power in the United States. A CNN columnist described the theory as merely a perspective that, quote, seeks to understand and address inequality and racism. Responding to criticism of critical ideas, a law professor who actually was responding to something that Mike and I wrote said, we just want racial justice and equality. If critical race theory's ideas are so simple and righteous, then why would it make parents so frustrated that they would take their children and switch schools like Rebecca did in Texas? And if the ideas are harmless, then why are some teachers and school officials hiding the content from parents? In Missouri, a teacher encouraged other teachers to take classroom material that promotes ideas such as white privilege off of school websites that parents can access. According to materials obtained by Parents Defending Education, the teacher told other educators to, quote, keep teaching, just don't make everything available on Canvas. That's the name of the school's website. District officials later said that the email was not approved by school officials, but the internet has a hard time forgetting. Likewise, in North Carolina, a teacher training program advised teachers to ignore parent input on the subject. 
One handout from the session attended by educators in Wake County, North Carolina's largest school system, read, quote, you can't let parents deter you from the work. Another question that was sent in to the group here asked, how can I respond with love when my son says there's no such thing as critical race theory? We can respond this way. Critical race theory is a philosophy, a worldview that views everything in public and private life in terms of race. Theorists reject the Enlightenment, are skeptical of the rule of law, and built their ideas on top of critical legal theorists and the original critical theorists, all of whom embraced Marxism. Again, the quote I read for you earlier, Marx's dazzling analysis of capitalism and his conviction that the laws of historical materialism would bring on the revolution of the proletariat as inevitably as the sun rises are still riveting to contemporary theorists. That's from Angela Harris in the last 20 years. From Derek Bell, it seems fair to say that most critical race theorists are committed to a program of scholarly resistance and most hope scholarly resistance will lay the groundwork for wide scale resistance. Earlier this year in May, the Attorney General from Montana wrote an opinion where he was uh, highly uh, critical of critical race theory. He said, quote, committing racial discrimination in the name of ending racial discrimination is both illogical and illegal. Half of parents in a nationally representative survey said they do not want schools to use material based on the idea that slavery is the center of our national narrative. They didn't say they don't want it taught. Of course it needs to be taught. But that's different than saying that that is the only thing that defines the United States. Nearly 60% of parents said that they want children taught that the nation's birth date is 1776, not 1619. 70% of parents said that slavery was a tragedy that harmed the nation, but our freedom and prosperity represent who we are as a nation, offering a beacon to those who want to immigrate here. At this point in the media cycle and the political cycle, critical race theorists' words along with educators who want CRT in classrooms matter so that we can answer some of the myths. So let's start with one. Critical race theory is just about history. If so, then why was Gloria Ladson Billings invited to give the keynote speech in 2019 for the National Council of the Teachers of Mathematics? Why did a National Association of Science Teachers have a critical race theorist give a keynote presentation about critical affinity spaces? Second myth, critical race theory is not being taught in schools. If that is the case, then why on the Portland Public Schools YouTube page, is there a group of teachers who meet with the name Critical Race Theory Group? <laughs> they had their summit in April. In Loudoun County, the school district contracted with a professional development company that used the words critical race theory in their training programs. Iowa City Schools has a lesson on their website on white privilege. California's ethnic studies curriculum, which came this close to becoming mandated for all schools in the district, has an entire section on intersectionality, which is the core element of critical race theory developed by Kimberly Crenshaw. Again, to quote Montana's attorney general from just a few weeks ago, a school unlawfully discriminates on the basis of race if it has effectively caused, encouraged, accepted, tolerated, or failed to correct a racially hostile environment. Notably, racial acts need not be targeted at any particular individual in order to create a racially hostile environment. That's why all of these lessons on white privilege or white fragility are condemning an entire ethnicity. The third myth, we need critical race theory in order to teach compassion. For those of you keeping track at home, the idea of compassion was taught long before critical race theory was even a thing. But in the 1960s, Franz Fanon, who developed the concept of decolonization, which is central to critical race theory today, he said the following, use all means to turn the scale, including, of course, that of violence. From Paulo Freire, who wrote the book I mentioned earlier, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he said more and more, the oppressors are using science and technology as unquestionably powerful instruments for their purpose, the maintenance of the oppressive order through manipulation and repression. The oppressed as objects, as things, have no purposes except those their oppressors prescribe for them. 
and this from a book that is used widely in teacher training programs today. So let's skip to the fun part. So what can we do? This was another question that was asked of uh, those on the panel today. So first, for parents, talk to your child's teacher, talk to your principal, talk to the administrators at school, let them know what you see on the websites, let the school board know what you see. Secondly, for policymakers, for those that have the ability to affect change, either at the school district level, at the state level, or beyond, it is very important that we center the response to critical race theory around the idea that no public official, no public institution, should compel a teacher or student to affirm, profess, adhere to, believe any idea that violates the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Basing a response to critical race theory on the idea that compelled speech is not appropriate, and in fact is something that the Supreme Court has rejected, as well as tying it to the Civil Rights Act and federal law, puts our responses on solid ground. The idea is not just to help schools teach students what it means to understand America's promise, but we must be prepared to design responses that will stand up in court when the opposition uses any means that they have to try to disrupt it. And given the stances of the National Education Association and the American Federation for Teachers, the nation's two largest teachers unions in the past few weeks, we know that this is something that they are very keen on. In fact, the NEA said at their uh, annual conference this summer that they intend to make sure that this idea stays in schools. So with that, let me leave you with this thought. Many, many, uh, many years ago in, in the 1940s, E.B. White, the author of Charlotte's Web, but also a regular uh, writer for The New Yorker, he described American democracy as something that was always in flux. There's always tension. There's always going to be something that is hard to define. We will always struggle with ideas because America is based on an idea. So we must be prepared to respond to a theory with a theory. Our theory must be civil. It must be civic. It must believe in America's hope for the future and believe that it is our responsibility not only to live out the founding principles of America's creed today, but to pass on the knowledge of what that uh, what those words mean, what our founding documents mean to the next generation. We can preserve it now. We can pass it to our children to preserve it tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you again, Jonathan. Doing double time this evening. We appreciate that very much. <laughs> Our next guest is Chantelle Cooper, and I met Chantelle for the first time at a rally that we did in Loudoun County on uh, June, Saturday, June 12th. And again, another individual who wasn't involved in politics. This is not her full-time job, not something that she's been involved in, but she's a mom and refers to herself as a mama bear. And she, um, she was willing to stand up and push back against the Loudoun County School Board. And that, that's what it takes, that's what we need. So, Chantel. Thank you for having me. I'd like to start by asking, how many of us started noticing something isn't right? Something is going on. Why so much advertisement on the word equity? Culturally responsive framework. Anti-bias. What is the new buzzword this week? If any of these questions trouble you, then we are all here today, not by co uh, coincidence, because of one reason, God. Right now, I feel I should get personal and share with you all who I am and where I'm from. My name is Chantel Cooper. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, a lover of people who despise, I mean, a lover of people who despise hate, racism, Marxism, and indoctrination. I'm someone who believes <laughs> sexuality, religion, and politics should never be taught in school. Yeah. 
That is my God-given right. As a parent and as a mother, it's my job, not the school board. Allow me to share about my humble beginning. I was born in Southern Maryland to a strong mother who instilled life values and morals. During my early childhood upbringings, my mother, myself, and my oldest sister were mentally and physically abused by my stepfather for simply not being his biological children. My mother finally left him with five children to take care of by herself. I watched my mother's struggles, fears, having to be a single mother on welfare and Section 8 housing. She would cry and demand, we never fall under the system or be a victim because it's hard for you to get out. Where I grew up in this housing development, there were black, white, Spanish, all colors, all race. We didn't see each other any differently. We just fed off each other's energy, good thoughts, to graduate and to do better, to never continue the cycle, the cycle of dependence. I can say I endorsed so much abuse to the point I was suicidal. I would enjoy my imaginary world because it was better than reality. I had problems speaking loud and clear, looking into a person's eyes and saying, I love you. I had very low self-esteem. I was being told for years I would never amount to anything. I was stupid. This one thing my stepfather would say is, you need me. Imagine a child going through this and also being raised in a very religious home. No holidays, no birthdays, no association outside except at religious events. I was taught not to vote, never to put your trust in man, which I understand. <laughs> you might look at me right now and ask, how did you overcome the hurdles? I overcame through faith. It took many years of unprogramming. Right now, I can sit here and explain critical race theory is abusive. It doesn't have anything to do with love or friendship. It divides us by race, causing discrimination. Where I reside now in Loudoun County, Virginia, teachers were trained on critical race theory. One of the direct quotes from the training material says, teachers have a special role to teach academics and inculcate morals. The teacher is the second mother. Parents' role is to socialize children and respect teachers' authority. Now imagine that. Our children in school are being told you are the oppressor by race, or being told they are oppressed as victims because of their race, or being excluded from being in an equity ambassadors club because of their race. Placing children in a category to blame for past history is dangerous. It alters the child's natural mind growth. Now, how is this an honest dialogue or looking through someone else's lens? You know, because of my past, I didn't become a victim. I prayed all the time. I wasn't perfect. I rebelled, but God never left me. In my 20s, I had my first child out of wedlock. I worked two to three jobs to not be under Section 8 housing. Through my faith, I had strength, and my strength allowed me to be a victor, not a victim. For my, <laughs> for my oldest sister, who endured the same mental and physical abuse, her traumatic experience didn't lead her to grow. Her mindset is stuck in being a victim. This is why critical race theory resonates in my heart, to absolutely ban it. I'm not a teacher or a philosopher. I'm just a mother who prayed, and God led me here to advocate for the innocent children. There were a few questions uh, submitted, and one uh, Jonathan did touch base on, and um, he answered that. Are our children educational books with CRT currently in Delaware schools? Yes. I encourage you to ask your children if they have an in-classroom library. These books in the classroom cannot be checked out. And again, this is my point of view from what is going on in Loudoun County, Virginia. If you feel sexuality 
religion, and politics should fall under your parenting role, you can exclude your child or pull them out. I found uh, packloudon.com. That's P-A-C, loudon.com. It's very useful. Uh, this website provides you opt-out letters and a list of books to look out for. Uh, one other question was, how do we stop this from being taught? Get involved in your, child, your children's school board meetings, curriculums. Ask your children's school, principal, teachers for instructional material, lesson plans, and literature. You want to see everything that is being taught. How do I respond with love when my son says there's no such thing as critical race theory? Make time and spend one-on-one -on -one time with your children, teaching them how amazing this country is and how to love our country. First thing I encourage you to do is research CRT and see how it resonates with you in your home and teach your children what to look out for. Again, packloudon.com helped me and reading anything I could get my hands on. I read it, I ingested it, and then I broke it down. Uh, Christopher F. Rufo. He, is, uh, he has a great article in the Imprimus. It's a monthly digest. You can subscribe to it. It basically, this article on critical race theory, it explains what it is, how to fight for it. Um, and momsforamerica.us. That is a very uplifting website. What can individual parents do to fight this? Get involved. Get involved in organizations. Build a network with people who are fighting the same fight. I realize we Americans have taken our freedom for granted. So research and think for ourselves. Don't let anyone tell you what your child will learn outside of the normal academics. For example, we all know the Jim Crow law was built to tear down the household between the mom and the dad. CRT, critical race theory, is to tear the child away from the parent. So you fight for your children. I don't know if you guys remember this saying, but it was Mr. Lennon. He said, give me one generation of youth and I'll transform the whole world. That, that's what's going on right now, guys. How do we stop this insanity? One step at a time, but first with God. Pray, get involved in the school board meetings, get involved in voting for your local governor. Ad officials are elected, so if we the people don't like something they are doing, we can petition to oust them. For closing, if the theory is not implementing love, leave it at the front door and lock it. Educate yourself and your children how to protect themselves mentally and physically. So when they walk out that front door, they will be able to think for themselves, not, for the, not what the society tells them they should do. Chantel, thank you so much for being willing to, to stand up and speak out. I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you very, very much. And we have another parent from Loudoun County. Uh, Joe Mobley is here this evening, and uh, he's going to share some insight as a parent and what it takes to push back. Joe, I'm hoping you're, you might address some of the questions also that uh, we've had from folks about about schools and how to, how to stop things. We're going to have a Q&A period after we have our last speaker. We will be having that as well. But if you, if you go to heritageaction.com slash ask, that's heritageaction.com slash ask, you can ask your question right now live. Um, so you can do that from your, from your smartphone, from your smartphone, or the folks that are watching live stream, because it's not just the folks in the room here. We have a lot of folks on the live stream that are watching, and we want them to be able to ask those questions too, and we're going to be going through those after the last speaker. All right. Man, I knew, I knew you were going to hold me down. This church has the best sound guy I've ever seen. <laughs> so, yeah, applause for him. So, but the new challenge is whoever's working the camera, get on the sticks. You can't just point it at the podium. It's not going to work. 
so we're going to talk a little bit about the divisiveness because we got scholars and we got people that experience communist China. Uh, I'm not a scholar and I have never been to China and I don't want to go to China uh, <laughs> because America is the greatest country in the history of the world. So, so we're just going to touch on, in my brief 10 minutes with you, we're going to touch on some practical, this is what divisiveness looks like. So I'm excited to speak to you. I'm excited to hear your questions. And I'm excited to go to the bathroom because I have the world's babyest bladder. My wife is pregnant with baby number four. And I say, you know, get over it. You just have to pee when you're pregnant. I have to pee all the time. I had to stop like six times just to get here. All right, so as you can see, I'm black. Surprise. Um, if your, you know, vision is not your thing, I'm black. And I'm also a millennial. I'm the world's worst millennial, guys. I'm sorry. My real job, I work for a technology firm. I don't know how I got in, probably because I'm black. But, <laughs> but I have one of these nifty things. And to Joe Biden's surprise, I know how to use the internet. So. I also have a lawyer and an accountant, but hopefully I won't need to call the lawyer. Uh, but everybody, take out your smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, don't embarrass yourself. Leave that razor in your pocket. <laughs> so take out your smartphone and hold it up. And you're probably thinking, oh, he's going to get me to subscribe to his YouTube channel or go to thejoemobleyshow.com. I know you've already done that, so I'm not going to ask you to do that or subscribe to his podcast. But hold up your smartphone. Hold it up, guys. I'm not going to move on until you do it. All right. Yeah. Now, put your hand down if you are not holding an iPhone. If you're holding a non-iPhone, you sinners, put your hand down. <laughs> All right, so everybody with your hand up, bless you. We are going to gather and pray for the souls of everyone that put theirs down. So iPhone, my, my people, my brothers and sisters, put your hands down. You all probably don't even know that there's a conflict that we all have, and iPhone users know about it. It's that short message service when we send text. Now, iPhone users, we have a thing called iMessage. It is, it's, a, it's a gift from above. And our messages have all these extra features. We can send each other these cool little, like if someone says, happy birthday or congrats, when I open it, the phone explodes, and I see fireworks, and someone throws a baby, and I kiss it. That's what happens when you have iMessage. I don't know what happens when you have dumb smartphones that some of you have. Uh, but we know instantly, because our messages are blue and gray, and the heathen messages are green and gray. You know what I'm talking about? She knows what I'm talking about. She's leaning over the person like, yeah, I know what he's talking about. We hate those group chats. We don't like to be in those group chats. There are some group chats that it's all blue bubbles, all gray bubbles. <sighs> Sigh of relief. And there are some group chats, and Jim knows. I see him shaking his head back there. We're in a group chat. Jim, I don't engage with that group chat a lot because it's green bubbles. And I like to live in the blue bubbles. And what's actually happened is the environment is different when I'm at home and I'm in my iMessages. And man, it's just great, righteous people. The environment is different in those bubbles. And sometimes we've got some choices. I can just remove myself. I don't have to be a part of those group chats. And you're in some group chats and you're in some group chats. We're all in some group chats together. And some of them are green bubbles, guys. And I got to say, I don't respond a lot to those. I don't because I'm an iPhone user, and I'm comfortable in iMessage with my, with my blue bubbles. So we can remove ourselves from it, we can reluctantly participate, or we can just not give a crap. There, there are some people in here, you're just hearing about this conflict, and it's fine, you can go on not giving a crap. But the issue is, the environment changed, and we've taken on beliefs based on the changes in that environment. Whether you wanted to do it or not, whether you knew that there was this blue bubble and this green bubble, and whenever you send me a godforsaken text from your Android phone, I want to throw my phone across the room as soon as I get in there. I go, ah, oh, it's not an iMessage. What's your number? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's on my business card, which also goes to my website. And it'll take you to where you can get one of my, you know, merchandise items. This is a shameless plug.
the funny thing is that number goes to an app. All of those messages are green. <laughs> but the environment is different. That's what CRT is. That's what all of the stuff that's been on all of the slides, that's what all of the stories that she told you, and it's she, not he. That's how she described it. That's, you can remember her name now. You've got it forever. You're welcome. <laughs> the environment changed, whether you wanted it to or not. People, has the environment in the United States changed? Okay, I, I thought I was crazy for a second. <laughs> has, has the environment at work changed? Say yes. yes. Okay. Whew. Has anyone's environment not changed at work? And are you accepting applications? <laughs> now, has the environment <laughs> at school, you guys, this, this is my fan club, I love it. <laughs> has the environment for students changed? Yes. Oh, you all just lied. You don't know. You just admitted you don't know what the heck is going on in schools. You guys come to church and lie? Uh, where's the pastor at? <laughs> okay, the teacher says it's changed. Okay, you guys are saved. So the problem is, the government's doing their thing. They're supposed to be doing this. The radicals are doing their thing. They're supposed to be doing this. The problem is, what are we doing? Because... And I got to get a little preachy because we're in church. Where this is the pulpit. This is where it goes down. So <laughs> when I open my Bible and I see that people are scared, I don't want to get fired. I don't want to get hated. I don't want someone to call me a racist. What's going to happen? You're racist. <laughs> Nothing happened. Oh, my goodness. But when I open my Bible and I look, Joshua 1.9, it's a commandment, not a suggestion, okay? You don't have to look in the footnotes. It says, have I not commanded you? to be bold and courageous. Don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, for your Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Does anybody's Bible say anything different? Raise your hand if your Bible says something different, and then we'll escort you out. <laughs> now, everyone's Bible says that. And the thing is, something's stirring right here. I'm not gonna talk about the nitty gritty, I'm almost out of time, but something's stirring right here. And someone's thinking, the young people are thinking, I'm too young, I don't have enough experience. The old people are thinking, I'm too old and I'm in this season of life where no one wants to listen to me, so no one does anything? Does that make sense to anyone? Say no. no. Okay, thank you. If that makes sense to you, see me afterward and we'll go through some, some re-education. The issue is it's up to you to do something. Has God moved in anyone's life? Yes. Oh, yes. Not a lot of people say yes on that. Did you see that? <laughs> Has God moved in your life? Put your hand up. Has he done some exciting things for you? Oh, yeah. Do you know what the Lord says to do with those memories and those things? Sure. He says to chuck them out the window because he doesn't care about them and you shouldn't either. When you go into Isaiah 43 and God is telling his people, haven't I brought you through the desert and fed you and clothed you and take care of your every need? Haven't I parted the waters of the Red Sea so you walked through on dry land, snuffed out Pharaoh's army like a wick? Haven't I 40 years later parted the Jordan, not a one-trick pony, but two bodies of water, and you go walking through on dry ground. It wasn't even muddy, guys. And God is reminding people of all of these miracles. Hasn't he done this? Hasn't he done this in your life? And he says, forget the former things. It doesn't matter. He doesn't care about that. He says, I'm doing a new thing, and now it springs up. Okay, springs in the wasteland and streams in the desert, but you guys are worried about, oh, what are people going to call me? Oh, all those, those great things. You know, a testimony is not when you got saved. A testimony is what God is doing in your life now. And you want to talk about, oh, when I was seven and they dipped me in the pool. No one cares. The fight's happening now. Wake up, okay? People are shaking heads and people are doing all that stuff. The fight's happening right now. So you got to decide, are you going to be Daniel chapter 5 and get thrown into the lion's den with Daniel? Or are you going to be chapter 3? And this is the end of my speech, okay? So if you feel like that, that warmth on your back, it's not sweat. I got pit sweat, okay? So we're friends now. And now that we're friends, because I'm being real to you on a Thursday night, and I tell you about my pit sweat, and I tell you that I got a baby bladder. So now we're all friends, okay? <laughs> so we're past all the bull crap, and we have to deal with your BS, okay? Your belief system. Because your belief system is messed up. And you need to get down with the belief system that you have the power, not because we the people is the sovereign in the United States, which is true, because the spirit of the living God lives inside you, okay? So with that, with that, and I'm, and I'm out of time, be Daniel chapter three. Don't wait to chapter five. 
so you have to get thrown the lines down. And that's an amazing story, and I'm not doubting that. But be Daniel chapter 3. So when the king, the president, the whomever comes out and says, when you see my statue, when you hear my music, then you turn and you fall down and worship to this great gold hideous thing. Okay, you be in an ocean of people that are bowing down to CRT, that are bowing down to all whites are racist, that are bowing down to the U.S. is systemically racist, which is bullcrap, smallest period of slavery in the history of the world, first nation of substance to abolish slavery, 330,000 of the 12 million slaves were brought here. That means 11.7 are missing because, again, I'm one of those black people that can do math. Five million brought to Brazil. No problems there. Don't bow down to this. You need to decide to be a Shadrach and Meshach or an Abednego and say, I don't care where the fiery furnace is. And more than that, get out. Do something. Go to the school board meeting. Maybe run for school board. Young people, you're not too young. Old people, you're not too old. Do something now. Now it springs up. Are we reading the same book? Are we? Then do what God's word says because it's relevant for us right now today in Delaware, in Loudoun County. We're doing it. We're, we're here. We had to drive here, fly here. Some people rode on horseback. I don't know. Do something. <laughs> we're going to answer your questions, but you got to promise to do something. Thank you very much. I think we're all still awake. <laughs> um, and again, it's heritageaction.com slash ask to ask your questions. Um, we have a couple more speakers and we're going to tackle those questions. Um, I'm going to take a quick moment here, though, to talk just a little bit about Heritage Action. So the Heritage Foundation, how many folks have heard of the Heritage Foundation? That's almost the whole room. I'm impressed. <laughs> How many of you, before you heard about this event, had heard about Heritage Action? Not quite as many. So Heritage Action is the action arm uh, that the, the foundation has awesome guys like Jonathan and Mike Gonzalez, and they write all this wonderful policy that, that we really wish Congress would pass. And Heritage Action <laughs> goes out, actually, and informs the public about what Congress is doing this week and on the short-term horizon and what that Heritage Foundation position is, you know, where, where are we coming from on that and where should we be? What would we like to see so that you can speak directly to your lawmakers, so you can speak directly to your congressmen and your senators and explain to them what's really in the bills that they didn't read and why they shouldn't be passing them, right? So when you go to heritageaction.com, you will find our issues toolkits. And we have cards on the table out front where you can download our CRT um, toolkit, our, our, either the toolkit or the PDF book, both. And we would love for you to do that. But even more, we would love to have you join us as a Heritage Action Sentinel. And um, that is something that so many folks have done across the nation. We have over 20,000 sentinels across the nation, so we hope that you will join us with that. And our next speaker is Jeremy Hunt, and he's going to talk about CRT in the military. What does that look like? What is, um, what's really going on in the military when it comes to CRT? And maybe even, uh, Jeremy, you might discuss some, a couple of the bills that we would love to see Congress support uh, to keep CRT out of the military and not fund CRT in the military. Thank you. Oh, look, it's hard coming after Joe. I mean, I, he has a good wake up pep talk. I love it. I need that like every morning. Get me ready for the day. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, well, look, it's, it's a privilege to be with all of you uh, this evening. Uh, I'm going to be talking about something that's very near and dear to my heart, uh, critical race theory in the military. Uh, I'm a proud uh, Army veteran. I served for five years as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure, I hope we have some veterans in the audience here. Do we have some veterans here among us? All right, there we go. There we go. That was awesome. Thank you for your service. Um, and look, so I have a little something for everyone here because every branch is implicated in what's going on, unfortunately. So I'm gonna go through kind of what, what's been going on. 
um, and kind of talk about it from, from the perspective of, of truth and what we believe and kind, of, and kind of give an assessment and then say what are some of the steps that we can take moving forward. Um, and I can tell you that I've, I've seen kind of both sides of this critical race. I mean, being in the military and then going, now I'm in, in law school, and, you know, I'll just say law school is just not quite as patriotic as it was in the military. It's a slightly different culture. Uh, and so I, I, I've seen how, how kind of uh, uh, both sides think about these issues. Um, and it's really kind of helped me think of, of good strategies for us as we, as we approach them. So first, I'm going to kind of give a little brush over what, what's going on. Um, first, in the Air Force, I don't know if there's any Air Force veterans here. I've bad news for you. Uh, at the Air Force Academy recently, uh, and for those that don't know, our nation's service academies are where we form the next generation, at least some of the next generation of military officers. These are the folks that will be leading um, our nation's sons and daughters um, in, in, in combat and everything else. Um, and so it's very important about what kind of education they're getting, what kind of leadership skills are being taught. Um, so at the Air Force Academy, which, you know, I'm a West Point guy, a West Point grad, uh, Air Force Academy, eh, that's okay. But, uh, so, uh, but at, at, at the Air Force Academy, there was a professor that recently came out, and, and I'll just, I mean, I'm thankful that she was honest about this. She came out in the Washington Post, wrote an article saying, I teach critical race theory at the Air Force Academy. This is a good thing. I'm endorsing this, and we need our next generation of officers to embrace this theory. Okay, so this is, this is the next generation, and so she boldly did this. I mean, and let me be clear, she's still teaching, the Air Force has stood by her, you know, no, no, no uh, any kind of recourse or anything like that, um, boldly declaring what's going on at, in the Air Force, okay? Uh, there's been even reports, even at West Point, my own academy, I gotta say, there are reports that, about these kind of sensitivity trainings where some folks are, at one point they said that all white police officers are murderers, it was something that was, so it was shared from some of the reports. Um, so these are things that you're not gonna hear about you know, obviously they're not promoting this. Um, you can even go to the Navy. I don't know if there's any Navy uh, uh, veterans here. Um, but even in the Navy, the uh, chief of naval operations, who's an admiral, has a recommended reading list, okay? So he has his reading list where he, he says all officers and senior enlisted uh, uh, officers need to read these books. And it kind of endorses it. These are, you know, leadership books about officer officership and everything else. Um, and on the book, and on the list, was Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be Anti-Racist, which, as uh, Jonathan went through, it literally says that the only way to correct past discrimination is to create new discrimination. I mean, it's, it's troubling, um, to say the least. So that's being taught at, at, in the Navy, even in the Space Force. I mean, our, our, our nation's newest branch. We had a Space Force officer who dared to speak out against critical race theory. Okay, there, all he said was, he said Marxism is wrong, we shouldn't be teaching this, and we shouldn't be teaching critical race theory in the military. He was relieved of his command, lost his job, okay? So, that, so that's what we're dealing with. And like, I, I was in, I, I was served from 2015 to 2020, uh, and I can say it is like a night and day difference uh, from uh, what happened from, from January uh, of 2021 to now, what's happened to this military. The Biden administration is, has a serious agenda uh, for our nation's sons and daughters. And unfortunately, a lot of them can't speak out against that, against what's going on or else they could lose their jobs. And one thing, uh, that, that Jonathan talked about was this, um, some of the myths that, we, that we've seen. And we've seen these in the military too. The first myth that we were told was that you know, CRT is not being taught in the military. We were, taught, we, were, we were told that. Well, we just had a professor come out with an op-ed in the Washington Post saying quite the contrary. And then we were told, and the, you know, they kind of shifted a little bit and they said, well, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just about history. We're not really, it's not laced with any normative values or it's not laced with any kind of prescriptions. It's just giving an account of history of what's going on. We also know that's not true. I mean, even in, even in the, the work, it talks about deconstructing oppressive mindsets and to, to transform our thinking and transform our mind. Um, and so, and, by the way, as a Christian, I, I, immediately my antenna goes up. I'm like, you're not going to transform my, th my, my thinking is transformed only by the word of God. So let me be very clear. There's no theory that's going to transform the way I think. And it's certainly not going to do it in the name of Karl Marx. It's going to be in the name of Jesus Christ who transforms my mind. Be, do not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our And so we, we see these kind of theories and everything else going on. And, and, if, and they try to tell us that it's not prescriptive. They don't want to change, you know, they're not trying to change the way you think about things, but we know that's not true. And then ultimately, they also said now that, well, okay, maybe we teach this. Maybe it's a little bit more than history. But, you know, we, we teach this alongside 
everything. You know, we, we learn about Maoism. We learn about all sorts of stuff. We should learn about history and just know things, that, you know, know different worldviews. Um, we're not really endorsing this. We're just giving kind of a neutral presentation about different ways of, of seeing the world. Uh, that's also not true because we know that it's being endorsed. And the bottom line is that we, our nation's sons and daughters are not sure whether they're reading books about leadership and officership and then in the next one is how to be anti-racist. Uh, you, you, you start to kind of get confused about, well, what's being endorsed here? What's being taught? And it, clearly it's being endorsed. It's being embraced. And, it, and you can lose your job if you speak out against it. And so what are we to do about this? Okay. Well, first off, as we all know, the, the way to drive out darkness is with the light, is with truth. That's first and foremost. So we have to expose what's going on in the dark. And one, one of the reasons why the left loves to use the military is because we have serious professional soldiers who love this country who are not going to you know, go against what their leadership says, and they, they're going to follow orders. And so when, when they do that, they're able to kind of get by with a lot of this stuff sneaking into our military, into the training, because our soldiers literally are not allowed to speak out against it. So it's on us to speak out and give them a voice when they can't do so in uniform. And so one thing that's, that's really awesome, uh, Senator Cotton and, uh, Dan, and, and Congressman Dan Crenshaw of Texas, they started a, a whistleblower complaint. Uh, form. And so you can actually go on their website, you can go to Dan Crenshaw's website right now and fill out a, if you have something going on in the military, you don't want to come out in your official name or in your title, you can actually do it without sharing your identity. And then, so that's one of the ways that we've actually been able to hear about some of these reports. Okay. Now just imagine that for a second. We're having to do whistleblower private complaints now to find out what's going on in our United States military. I mean, that's, that's where we are. And, and folks, it's, it's only June. Folks, we're, we're six months into this. <laughs> Oh, July, rather, sorry. So seven months into this. It's been long. It's been a long year. Uh, and so, I mean, we, we, have to, we have to think about this and, and be very serious about what's, about what's going on. And so, and it's up to us to give a vote. I mean, these are folks that are protecting us. We have to protect them from what the Biden administration is trying to do to our United States military. And we... Absolutely. And so, I mean, as you heard from, from some of the f folks here, we got to call your congressman, call your senator, make it clear, have a voice and say, look, we need legislation to make it clear that we are going to stand up for those who protect us. And then ultimately, absolutely, we need to pray. Because, look, it's, at the end of the day, we can talk about theories, we can talk about ideologies and everything else, but ultimately, racism is a sin problem. Okay, this is not a, you, some of you might have heard it's not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. And folks, the only antidote to sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be very clear about that. So, so when we're dealing with these things, we have to understand that we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. We're dealing with serious issues here, and we need to be praying about this. Okay? And on a, on a, on a last thing I would say, I implore you to, to be bold. Look, it might look like we are losing. It might look like, oh my gosh, folk race there is taking over and all of our institutions. It looks like the left is winning. And some of you might be discouraged. Some of you have given so much to this country. You served, even if you haven't served in the military, you served in other capacities. You've shared these things with your kids and you, you've made, you try to get it going with the next generation and, you're see, and you feel like you might have lost. But I'm telling you right now that we win in the, at the end of the day because we stand on the truth. And there is no, no theory, no ideology can defeat the truth. And so that's what we come in. That's why we walk boldly. I'm at a school that is, does not really like what I have to say a lot of times. But, I, but I, I walk boldly because I know that I'm standing on the word of God. And you can cancel me, you can try to shut me up, whatever you want to do. But the bottom line is that the light is going to drive out darkness. And so, so, so stay bold, stay, 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 uh, uh, be, be confident, okay? And, and do not let the world tell you that it's over. What they want you to do is just kind of throw, you know, just kind of throw, your, throw the, the, the uh, towel away, throw, throw the towel in the ring and just kind of give up. And, and I'm going to be, if I can be really real with you, there are a lot of conservatives that think that's the right way to do this, that the right way is just to retreat and give up. I'm not giving up my country to, the, to, the, to darkness. I'm going to tell you that right now. So if, if, if you... And so if that, if that is your, if you, if you believe with me, I, I just implore you to 
Take these action steps that you're hearing here uh, and continue to, to come strong together and stand, and stand up for truth uh, as we battle this injustice. So thank you so much. God bless you guys. Thank you. thank you so much, Jeremy. I, and I do want to say we do have to pray. There's no doubt. Um, but I, I have been told previously that, you know, we can't just pray for that hole to get dug. We have to pick up the shovel and dig. And to that end, one of, the, one of the things that Heritage Action does is we let you know about the specific legislation that is being proposed. And we have endorsed the, and we support the Stopped CRT Act in the military. And this is H.R. 3179. And so that is definitely something that you should be contacting your representatives directly on and telling them that you want them to support defunding, defunding CRT in the military. Our last speaker, I think, is so, so very important. We're, every single one of these speakers is important. But Stephanie Holmes, I cannot begin to tell you how hard it was for me to find an HR, a human resources professional, who could actually come out and speak publicly about the topics that I wanted to have addressed here this evening. Because when it, I, I, and I specifically, I was like, so, so I want to find somebody who is willing to address diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, how that impacts, what, is, what happens when companies use DEI and skin color instead of meritocracy as the gauge by which they hire, fire, and promote individuals in the workplace. And what does that do actually to productivity and morale in the workplace? And so with that, Stephanie Holmes, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thanks so much, Melody. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. As Melody mentioned, my name is Stephanie Holmes. Um, as a way of background, I'm a labor and employment lawyer. Um, I recently started an HR consulting firm called Brighter Side HR. Um, prior to that, I was an in-house counsel in corporate America for a number of years, um, focusing on labor and employment matters. And then prior to that, I worked at a large law firm um, in DC and Chicago. And from my vantage point, um, I have a number of concerns about critical race theory and its impact on workplaces across America. Um, you know, I think that more diversity and inclusion, including broadly uh, defined to include a diversity of viewpoints and experiences and perspectives, is in, in the workplace is a good thing um, and a laudable goal, and there are definitely lawful ways to accomplish that. But the way that programs have been implemented um, in the last several months especially, I believe are creating um, risk for companies and creating negative workplace cultures for employees. And while companies may do, be doing things in the name of diversity, um, they, uh, a lot of the things that they are doing may be violating discrimination laws. So I'd like to talk, touch on three topics tonight. Um, the first one, training. Um, it's one of the most notable uh, topics to come to mind is the training that is being implemented by the diversity and equity and inclusion departments and HR departments. Much of the training is incorporating concepts of critical race theory. Um, you may be personally familiar or have had experiences with that type of training or heard or read about it. Employees are being required to attend um, or strongly encouraged to attend you know, training sessions or to participate in conversations with their coworkers or their leadership team about sub such topics as you know, white fragility, white guilt, systemic racism, how to be an ally in the workplace, and other social justice issues. And I believe that some employers are not uh, fully considering the risk of liability under Title VII. As you may know, uh, Title VII is a federal law that protects against discrimination in employment based on a number of protected categories, including race, and so it um, prohibits race discrimination in the employment context. And relevant here are, is the potential for uh, race discrimination claims and hostile work environment claims based on race. And the concern from a company perspective is that the content of this training may be used as evidence of the company's uh, racial bias or racial hostility, and that may be a factor in substantiating uh, discrimination or hostile work environment claims. Um, one, uh, just to elaborate a little bit on the hostile work environment claim, 
those can be hard to establish. The standard is high. Um, in order for a claim to be successful, um, enduring the offensive or harassing conduct um, has to, must be a condition of continued employment, or the conduct must be considered, quote, severe and per or pervasive. But here, you know, if employers are consistently requiring employees to participate in this type of training or have these conversations um, where their racial group is being portrayed negatively, that could constitute a hostile work environment claim. And just remember that um, those types of claims can be brought by either um, a, a member of any racial group, so a member of a minority group or a, a member of a majority racial group. Um, aside from the legal issues associated with the, with the DE&I training, at the bare minimum, it's bringing a very uh, controversial political issue into the workplace. Um, and not only any political issue, but one that is centered on an employee's protected category, their race. Um, and, um, and from an employment law perspective, that is uh, certainly concerning. And some pl employers are also requiring engagement with DE&I efforts as part of their performance review process. And so I believe that there are several negative impacts to employees as a result of this. Um, the country, as we know, is very uh, polarized politically at the moment, and with basically half of the population on one side and half the population on the other side. Um, so bringing any kind of political issue into the workplace is going to be very difficult to manage from an employee relations standpoint. And with regard to CRT specifically, as recent surveys have illustrated, you know, a majority of Americans have an unfavorable view of it. So when roughly half or more than half of employees are forced to listen to or forced to, to some degree, adhere to um, an ideology that they oppose, you know, that can lead to lower employee morale, disengagement, discord among employees, conflict among team members, and um, employee turnover, all of which have been demonstrated to lead to lower productivity and a negative workplace culture, um, which is not helpful for anyone ultimately. Um, some questions um, that were submitted um, tonight about this topic, um, a couple people asked about what employees can do in response to this type of DE&I training. Um, and so my sh short answer is speak up, um, stand up. Um, if you believe it's creating a hostile work environment based on your race, consider filing a complaint with HR. Um, a lot of companies also have anonymous hotlines. You can file your concern that way if, um, if you feel more comfortable doing that. If it doesn't help, um, you know, consult an attorney, um, file an external charge of discrimination, you know, and or consider filing a lawsuit. Um, also, um, find like-minded employees at your company um, and consider going together to HR or to management and voice your concerns. And I know that's difficult. I know that can seem very intimidating and scary, especially when your livelihood is on the line. Um, but remember that filing either an internal complaint or an external complaint is uh, as protected activity, it's legally protected activity. So your employer um, shouldn't um, and they can't under the law retaliate against you in any way for, for doing that. So point being, um, it takes courage, but speak up. Moving on to the next topic, the concept of equity. Um, you know, there have been efforts seen around hiring and promotions, um, for example, in the name of equity. We've seen many large companies publicly commit to having a more diverse workplace um, with some pretty aggressive diversity goals. Um, and some of that might be a step in the right direction. Um, what is concerning, though, from an employment law perspective and an employee morale perspective um, is, the, is the question of whether hiring managers are treating these types of commitments as racial quotas rather than aspirational diversity goals. And treating them as quotas is problematic from an employment law perspective. You know, companies cannot hire people based on race. They cannot consider race as part of um, any kind of employment decision. And when managers are under pressure to improve diversity, you know, there's concern that programs may be being implemented in a way that overlooks qualifications in favor of race, which is inconsistent with the law. You know, it's unclear how, company other, how else companies may be implementing concepts of equity. You know, for example, are they, you know, requiring a certain number of work projects to go to minority employees? Um, you know, and again, that's inconsistent with Title VII. Um, you can't make decisions in the employment context based on race. Um, does it mean that every employee receives the same performance rating? Will performance ratings be eliminated? Um, will, you know, everybody ultimately receive the same compensation? And I believe that moving away from 
um, providing incentives to employees based on their merit and performance can decrease productivity, stifle talent, um, and lead to less job satisfaction and higher turnover. Um, the third topic I'd like to just touch on briefly tonight is regarding um, off-duty conduct. Um, another trend associated with CRT concerns um, an employee's conduct and speech outside of the workplace on their personal time. So, for example, if you per, uh, make a, uh, if you post on your social media page, on your personal social social media page, for example, um, you know, related to CRT, um, some employers are taking a closer look at social media um, as part of the application process um, for candidates or internal candidates to see, you know, among other things, whether there is any evidence that the applicant um, is racist. Or it's also not uncommon for um, a coworker to notice, you know, a personal social media post and bring it to the attention of the employer. And the problem with this potentially is how do you define racist and how do you define racism? Um, so, for instance, if in the social media post um, the individual, you know, questions the questions systemic racism or um, shares an article that questions systemic racism, you know, will that individual be overlooked for a job opportunity, or if it's a current employee, you know, will they be disciplined or terminated for, um, you know, voicing an opinion that is inconsistent with corporate values. And I believe that this has a chilling effect on free speech outside of the workplace, which I find very concerning. You may have seen um, a poll by the Cato Institute um, last summer that found that 62% um, of Americans feel that they can't share their beliefs um, because they're afraid that it will offend other people. Um, and I, it's a big guess, but I would suspect that that number may be even higher this year than last year, given the proliferation of cancel culture. And I worry that that's uh, creating a culture of fear both inside and outside of the workplace. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, none of it is easy, but it um, is not impossible. Um, you know, to employees, again, um, you know, speak up, stand up, um, know your rights, um, exercise your rights. If you feel like you've been discriminated against, um, you know, or you, if you feel the training material is creating a hostile environment for you, um, you know, file an internal complaint, consult an attorney, file an external complaint, consider filing a lawsuit, um, and remember that that is protected activity. You have a right to do that. Um, and to employers, um, you know, those who may not want to adopt, um, you know, more uh, woke agenda in the workplace, um, a, a similar suggestion um, to those employers, you know, speak up and stand up. Um, for the other employers, I would just suggest and encourage them to really consider the impact of CRT-based programming on um, the workplace overall and the legal risk associated with it, many aspects of it. Um, also also, you know, consider developing policies that support a more viewpoint neutral, um, less divisive, and positive workplace environment. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. So we're going to move into our question and answer phase of this evening, and obviously we are about running out of time. We, we do want respect your time. Um, we're probably going to run just a couple of minutes over. We won't be offended if you if you leave, but um, we do we have we've been uh, uh, racking up some questions that we want to get answered. But before I move into that question and answer phase, I do want to give a special shout out to Al Freck and Marilyn Booker, who have helped if the two of you would please stand up just for just a moment, because you two were really instrumental in helping to in helping to uh, organize and bring this event here this evening locally. And uh, Nicole Theus at a Delaware Family Policy, I'm hoping that, th that you guys have some, that, that they have some literature out front um, for you guys to pick up. Definitely want you to support Delaware Family Policy here in the local area as well. And so we're gonna jump into some quick questions if we can. And uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask you guys to be succinct and we're, we'll, we're gonna do just a really quick um, round, round, uh, round robin of these things. So how do we, what questions can we pose or freedom of information requests, how do we phrase it to be able to identify CRT content being taught in schools? So I guess John, Jonathan or my teachers or my parents, any of you. Um, I know 
that they've changed it to culturally responsive framework. Um, there's a equity ambassador that you need to look out for. Um, hold on, I have another one. Jonathan, you want to take as I look well? I mean, for it? there are other terms such as bias response teams. Yeah. Those are being used in K twelve schools as well. Um, I think the biggest idea is to, as you you know, if you are looking for more information, um, to look for discriminatory content because that is that's really what I think is is driving much of this. Um, I think that it can be found across many subjects, and so uh, it's not just in say history or English, although it is commonly found there. Culturally responsive learning is a new word, you know, is, is a term that's, that's used quite a bit. Uh, Socio-emotional learning as well. Now remember, terms like that, they're not necessarily bad, right? I mean, we're not, uh, it's, it's not as though you need to think that, okay, I'm a hammer and everything's a nail. I think it is better for us as a movement to be looking for what is asking someone to affirm the idea that racism or discrimination is okay or that a certain group of people based on the color of their skin are guilty of uh, actions regardless of behavior, right? Those are the concepts that uh, we need to be very clear about. Can All right, very what good. They need to capture in the FOIA? Say that again. The documents they need to capture in the FOIA, the emails. That... The documents that you need to capture in the FOIA are gonna be emails, curriculum documents, school board, member emails, superintendents, administrators, procurement documents. These are the things that you want to FOIA. And uh, what Jonathan was explaining is you're going to do like a query, which is not hard. You control F in a Word document. Or you, if you've got an Excel open, then you can do an advanced find query. Uh, but then you, you look for all of that stuff that he laid out. If you go to heritageaction.com under issues, we have a CRT issues toolkit that actually has a document within it that shows you how to do a Freedom of Information Act request to your school boards and your, your, your schools. So you can find that information there. Jeremy, what would your advice be to a person who's in the military in, in dealing with CRT? How can you do that within the military? Yeah, well, I would first say that for those in leadership positions, we have to be clear that, you know, first and foremost, we support the Constitution in the United States. Uh, we are all created equal. And so I think in, in our leadership skills, it's important that we impart that, hey, we are all one team, one fight. We're not sitting here looking at judging each other by the color of our skin. We are in here for one mission, and that is to defend the United States. So I think that's that's going to be really important for those who are um, who are you know, for the soldiers that are that are out there following leadership that's that's gone in, in, in odd directions recently. Um, I, I have to say I would you know submit the, the whistleblower whistleblower complaints online, uh, and then just make sure you tell people who are not in the military so that we can speak up for you. Very good. So. Um, there is a teacher in Kansas um, who says that she's hearing a lot about equity at her school during staff meetings. And towards the end of the last school year, the principal asked the staff, um, especially the white teachers, to share about their whiteness. Um, and she really didn't know what he meant. But she, she's very much appreciated the panel this evening. And what, what she wants to know is, where can she find out more, um, I think it was Joe that was talking about the uh, packloudon.com, what's the spelling on that? You had Moms for America in Paris. Uh, what other places can she find out information so, sh so she can push back better? That you was some, for me. You had some websites, I think? Uh, I think Chantel had some websites, Pack Loudon. Loudon is L-O-U-D-O-U-N, Pack is Papa Alpha Charlie, you know, pack. It's one so. word, right? It's okay. Fightforschools.com, great website. Heritage Actions website is also great. Um, what's uh, the moms? Chantel was yes, momsofamerica.us, and also in Primus, you can register or subscribe to it. You can find all of Heritage's material at heritage.org slash CRT, as well as Parents Defending Education is also a group that's working on this issue as well. Chantel, I don't know if it would be you or Jonathan um, who would take this, but how do you convince your high school student to not spin their essay to satisfy the liberal teachers in order to get the A grade when they don't really believe what they're writing? 
And I can hear from the audience that they, they really want to know how to deal with this. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? You can start. Um, okay, so I, I think if, uh, I mean, there are two ways to go about it, right? We need to understand what these concepts are in order to uh, effectively rebut them, okay? So if a student is being asked to affirm or profess that these ideas are right, no one should be, a, a, you know, Co coerced or compelled, right, to say that this is the only way to describe history. So, you know, I am a parent of two high schoolers. I have conversations with my children about this all the time, um, but they um, uh, I know what is what is out there. So I, I think, you know, it's, it's, this is very much a relational issue. I'm not sure that you're looking at a, 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 you know, a table of people for parenting advice. I mean, I would suggest know what the other side, um, know what critical race theorists are trying to say and what they are trying to accomplish. It is important that they do that in high school because it's gonna come in college anyway, right? So having these conversations with your students now is important because when they're off on their own, when they go to college, they'll be more on their own, right, to have to deal with these issues. So help them prepare now, understand what these philosophies and what these theories are trying to do, and then be prepared um, to stand up for it now and be with them, support them now as they do that because they're going to have to go and do it on their own in high school and as we've heard in the workplace as well. And for Stephanie, um, in your experience with lawsuits, do you see it being cheaper to pay off for the, for the companies to pay off the litigants rather than to litigate, to pay off the, the folks that are making the a a allegations? And have you seen any laws written with the words allegement and ac accusation in them um, or policies? Um, yeah, I think that is something, um, an obstacle, right? I mean, other, anytime, any, any type of um, uh, charge um, is received by a company alleging discrimination or they receive a demand letter from an appointed attorney, there's always a, a consideration, um, understandably, about whether it's going to um, be more cost effective to settle a lawsuit initially um, or to, you know, take it all the way to trial. Um, so absolutely, I think that um, I think that uh, we may not hear about a lot of the lawsuits because they may be, you know, settled very early on. Um, and so I think it will take very special plaintiffs to um, have the courage to fight um, all the way uh, to trial in a public manner. So I, I, I do see that being an obstacle. Okay. Um, for Chantel, a teacher in our local high school was giving students printed material not in the curriculum and not approved. Had the student not showed his parent, it would have gone unnoticed. I believe the title of this uh, handout was The Hate You Give. How do you know this is going on? How would I know how it's going on? Or just the... Well, how, how can a parent know if it's not in the curriculum? And I guess I, I've even heard where the teachers tell the students not to repeat the question to the parents. Or... Um, like I explained earlier, it is very important for you to communicate with the principals, the teachers, the counselors, your children. Find out uh, the curriculums, uh, the material lessons, the literature. They're not going to tell us. They already have libraries inside of the classroom, and, the t and they're not allowed to return, you know, bring these books home. So why would they tell us? So you have to do the research yourself. And we wouldn't have found out in Loudoun County what books they were reading until the kids were home for virtual school. So it's up to us. Uh, for Jonathan and Stephanie, what is the connection with DEI and CRT? And again, DEI is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and of course, critical race theory. What's the co what is the connection? How is it connected? Yeah, I, um, I think that one of the first things that comes to mind is that it is viewing people um, as their racial identity, first and foremost, um, and putting them in that category as opposed to really um, appreciating and valuing employees as individuals um, and their you know, individual merits and qualifications. Um, so that's the first thing that comes to mind. And then um, just the concepts of equity um, and that being applied in the workplace um, you know, in the workplace scenario. Jonathan, I don't know if you have anything to add to that from your, from your perspective. I mean, I would just say, broadly speaking, that critical race theorists can use what, whatever terms that they choose that will fit their, what they're trying to apply it to. So is diversity bad? 
No, right? As a concept, it's fine, and it's actually quite good in many cases. Equity used to be something that we wanted as well before it was co-opted. The same thing with inclusion. So when you see diversity, equity, inclusion today, it's been something that is being used by critical race theorists to promote the idea that government should create equal outcomes for everyone artificially, right? That's the problem. So the same can be said for culturally responsive learning. I mean, is cultural bad? Well, no. Is learning bad? Well, no. That's not either, right? That's why when you do a FOIA, when you look at what's being taught in schools, you do have to read the footnotes and look at the second page, right? It's worth looking at what is actually being suggested. A quick example. I know we're doing a, a round robin here. Very quick. Washington, D.C. public schools page has a whole section on teacher training. One of them says culturally responsive learning. If you just read what it describes about how teachers need to be sensitive to the backgrounds of children, you wouldn't think it's that bad. But when you click on the link and you go to the article that it recommends, it says that teachers should take a chart and they should mark the race of every author of every textbook in the school. That's not going to help the textbooks. That's not going to help students learn any better. That's not evaluating the quality of them. That's judging them based on the color of the skin of the people that wrote them, right? But if you just looked on the outside, you would think that it was a Lucky Charm cereal box, right? Um, Jonathan, again, who are the major proponents pushing CRT today? Well, many of those that develop a critical race theory are still active um, in universities. So Gloria Ladson Billings is a, um, uh, I believe that she's emeritus now, but at the University of Wisconsin. Kimberly Crenshaw has been writing widely these days in, uh, in uh, major publications, the Washington Post, New York Times. Um, uh, Ibram X. Kendi's, you know, he has, in some cases, sort of either denied or, or sort of um, tried to obscure whether or not his ideas are strictly critical race theory or they're just what he calls anti-racist. There are um, uh, articles, there are interviews that we can quote him as saying that his ideas are based on critical race theory. And when you read what his recommendations are, particularly the equality of outcomes, you can see that those concepts do come from critical race theory. There are many who say that Robin D'Angelo is not a critical race theorist, so she's the author of White Fragility. I would argue that her, her ideas are straight from uh, critical race theory as well. Um, I think that those companies that are doing professional development in schools uh, based on critical race theory, uh, particularly Learning for Justice, which is an arm of the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, that they are widely used. And their material is, uh, there's no joking there. You don't even have to read the second page. You can just read the headlines uh, with what's on their site. Um, so th those are a couple. All right. So for Joe and Chantel, um, I guess this is more about trying to formulate a strategy at school board meetings because this individual says they're limited to speak for only two minutes. And it's not enough time to really get through the messages. So do you recommend that they organize with other parents so they each take a segment and build on one another as they go through and, and make their presentation? Yes, that, that's what we did. That's okay, what you should do. Uh, and so whether that's breaking down passages of a book, hey, you're going to read this, you're going to read this. I got tagged with saying all the bad words because they knew my pastor would be listening. Uh, but really, everyone's being really nice up here. Again, you know, former law enforcement, rescued children, army. I don't give a crap about your BS, your belief system. You need to learn Dave Ramsey's one word sentence. No. Children don't run the household. A lot of you are agreeing and clapping your hands, but you're not doing it at home. Your child is subject to your authority until they are not, okay? Now, spiritually, for much longer, but why, while they're under your roof, you have to say the one word sentence, no. I'm gonna write the paper this way to appease the teacher. No, you're not, your phone's gone. Your internet, I'll shut off the internet to the house, I don't care. <laughs> Parent. We don't have a student debt crisis. We don't have a, a debt crisis. We have a parenting crisis. So parent your children. Parent's a word. Do it. So um, we, what is the panel's opinion about requiring cameras, live stream in school so parents can monitor class content? Yes. I say that is a good idea, but why do we... 
how did we get here? Why? I encourage everyone to pull their child out of public schools and go into a school that believes in your morals and the way you want to raise your child and under the academics that we are already used of math, science, English, reading. Melody, can we shoot down a leftist myth while we're here? Okay. So this is why we're for school choice people, because the left, they're not too smart. I'm sorry. Maybe one of them is watching and they can learn something here. The school choice thing, they're like, oh, the poor mom, she doesn't have an ID, she doesn't have internet, she doesn't have whatever. She has all of these things. School choice is about using funds that are already used on a student. Some of the poorest districts out here with the most terrible schools, they're spending 10, 15, up to $22,000 per pupil. So giving that money to the parent and saying, by law, you have to use this on your child's education. I'm not a mathematician. But if someone gave me a $20,000 check and said, make a better life for your kid's school, I think I could figure it out. So that's why we're for charter school and school choice. Right. So I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to give Jonathan the last question here. What is a better and less divisive way to teach students the complex history of the United States? I think trying to interpret history th through a theoretical th framework, no matter what the framework, is a fool's errand. Why can't we just teach them what happened? So I think including the facts is important. I think uh, include, and I don't, I don't know that uh, any teacher would really disagree with that, right? I think you want to teach children about the ideas of slavery, of the Jim Crow era. But it's also worth saying that most of the states in the North had abolished slavery by 1800, um, or put it on the road to abolishing it, um, and that there were um, uh, Americans who were black who were also remarkably successful in terms of business and creating um, uh, businesses and jobs and money for themselves, even through uh, the 19th century leading into the Jim Crow era. The issue was then that um, uh, though that government was uh, not fulfilling America's promise uh, by treating people the way that the Declaration and the Constitution had intended. And so uh, once you get to the Civil Rights Movement and the Civil Rights Act, we have to make a demarcation and we have to say that America's promise um, has been fulfilled, right? Not because racism is gone, that's a sad fact of human life, but because culturally now we condemn it. We condemn it uh, from the, uh, the level of the government, we condemn it as a people, and it has no place any longer. And so that is the separation between what is being taught in, call it whatever you will, uh, anti-racism, whatever, critical race theory. It's this idea that um, those things didn't matter. And they did matter. The Civil Rights Act does matter and still matters today. Awesome. Thank you very much. I want to thank this panel. I, thank you so much. And I have. I know we have a lot more questions, and the panel has agreed that what, what we're going to try to do is, if you still send your questions to heritageaction.com slash ask, I'm going to give those questions to the panel, and we're going to try to figure out some way, if you've registered, to send you back out the answers to those questions. Um, I really want to thank Crossroads Community Church for allowing us to have this meeting in their lovely church this evening. So thank you all very, very much, and thank you for hanging out for an extra few minutes. Thank you. Yeah.